Hi, Marco. Good morning for me. Good evening to you. Hello. Good morning, and thanks for uh, inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. It's your fourth time, fourth or fifth time back on, I think. Some something I <laughs> in, in that number. <laughs> um, I don't remember. It's like the first. I was. Time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, like honestly, like, I was mentioning to I think Matthias is. I feel like like Saturday Night Live. I should have some of those like special jackets once you're you're a five timer <laughs> that, ah, okay. that you can have for the for the guests who who've been on enough times. Um, but uh, no, I mean it, it's it's always a welcome opportunity when you can get back it on. It usually means that something exciting has happened um, somewhere in the DAX universe, and in this case, it's yep. uh, some some new products that have uh, come out that will be very good yeah. at quickly analyzing uh, models, which I, I've got a chance to test last year. And so far it's got, it's had me uh, yeah. pretty excited. So um, thank you for coming back. Uh, but um, yeah, it's a good way to, I think, to usher in a new year. And it looks like we already have 37 people yeah. uh, hanging out from all around the world. So yeah. it's always nice, nice to see people who get excited about DAX. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, the um, uh, actually we worked on this project for several years. Uh, it was a, a, an idea of many, many years ago, the idea of having, you know, a system that automatically analyzes a model finding potential issues in the, the DAX code. And for several years, we worked together with uh, uh, Daniel uh, Otiger, who is the author of mm -hmm. Tabular Editor, uh, with other people that we involved at a certain point to have enough, uh, you know, development power and last year we started a private preview then a public preview and now we're still in a private uh, sorry in a public preview mode we still have to complete a couple of features we will talk about that later but we are close to ga and so when we will go ga we will also have more material more uh, communication this is the first time we sh uh, we actually make a presentation using dax optimizer because uh, as a choice we said okay we wanted to wait to stabilize the ui and yep. the features uh, and, but now we, we're pretty much ready, so we can start showing something. And uh, I hope that it will uh, it will be you know nice to know for many people that still didn't try it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I remember this came. I, I think I I got a chance to test it way back in May or June of last year. So you've yeah you've definitely spent um, a good amount of time. I think getting it polished and as you said completely ready before you did any yeah. uh, official walkthroughs of it yeah. um, versus just letting the community yeah, yeah. write their own opinion pieces on um on how it worked and everything else so i have yeah. it's been nice to just even watch some of the 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 slow iterations and additional features that have shown up in um in the tool yeah. just as you uh, built it out but yeah i think this is some pretty yeah. exciting stuff and anything that i can do where i can click a button and be and am given recommendations on what to do from the, either the model or the report layer. Yeah. It saves myself and I think anybody who works in Power BI a lot of time for sure. Yeah. Yeah, you get a mini yeah, market so... with this. <laughs> That's a, a, a way to clone our knowledge, actually. Not, not ourselves, but the, the knowledge, yeah. Uh, the, in part is what inspired us. It was uh, how mm -hmm. can we automate most of the activity we do when we provide consulting to solve uh, a problem in DAX, then we will talk about what, what, what do we mean by optimization, but because it's not just the performance, it's also something else. But, 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 but basically, yeah, we, we can pretty much automate many things and in, in, a, in a deterministic way. So if you repeat the same thing twice, you get the same result. It's not, you know, just, just like uh, AI, we, I love the, the, the advancement in AI. It's just not uh, ready for doing tasks that actually require a different approach that is more algorithmic because uh, the, the, the yeah. idea is that we want to, you know, we, we want to be sure of what we are doing. We, we don't want to just uh, throw the dice. Uh, I mean, in Vegas, when at the fabric conference, we will do that. So, <laughs> yeah. but when, 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 when we work, we, we actually would like to have more certainty about the result. And that's uh, what we, we try to, to create. So it's, it's a very big investment, but actually uh, it is providing good results. Oh, yeah, this is exciting. Um, if you're ready, I, we can uh, flip over yep. to, uh, to the Yeah, I, I just started. have a yeah. couple of slides. So, of course, we will spend most of the time uh, um, doing demo. 
-hmm. But let me just uh, quickly introduce uh, DAX Optimizer. So DAX Optimizer is a product from Tabular Tools. Tabular Tools is a new company uh, that worked in stealth mode for a while. And now last year we made it public. I'm one of the founders. And it's a, basically a collaboration between SQL BI and Tabular Editor, the company that produces the, the, the tool that is named Tabular Editor. This is just to give uh, some, some context about where we are. The URL will www.daxoptimizer.com is where you can find the service. And the goal is to, yes, of course, optimize DAX. But in reality, the idea is that uh, the first problem we want to solve is to provide in best practices, writing DAX. And this provides uh, three advantages, three, three, three benefits. The first and more obvious one is the performance. You, you write good DAX code, you also get fast DAX code. That's the number one. But the number two is readability because uh, we can make the code easier to read and then we can make the code easier to maintain, which is pretty much uh, related. So let's talk about performance. Uh, performance means actually two things. The first and more obvious one, we want our repo to run faster, clearly. But in reality, there are two elements that you have to consider. One is the CPU consumption, and the other is the memory consumption. You want to lower the CPU consumption, but you also want to lower the, the memory consumption for a simple reason. When you publish a report and you have more than one user, uh, you have multiple users that consume resources on the server. And when you have Power BI Premium capacity, you start to consume our capacity and at a certain yeah. point the the if you exhaust the memory that you have available you are in trouble because at that point you will have errors and what can you do yeah one option is you can just raise the capacity level which means that your first step of advancement is additional five thousand dollar per month sixty thousand yeah. dollar per year so the when you say, oh, we have to increase the capacity, you're saying, okay, each step is $60,000, 60 grand per year, which is not cheap. So maybe that you could spend some time trying to optimize uh, something. And most of the times it, it's convenient if you hire a consultant that does the job of, uh, of optimizing. But the idea is that if I can do this with a tool and the tool it's also cheaper than the consultant. Why not? I mean, that, that even though the tool will not find everything, okay, let's uh, set the expectation at the right place. But actually, it, it, the return of the investment could still be very good. So lower consumption means delaying the need for increasing the capacity just because you are consuming too much memory. So even though you don't see the problem with a single user, it could be important when you have multiple concurrent users. So this is the, the um, one important element. But then optimizing for uh, readability means that, that when you look at the code, you understand what the purpose was. So, I mean, I have I've wrote a formula. What was the intent of the formula? The more you create a code that, oh, I use it to SQL and I write the code in DAX as I was used to do in SQL. The problem is that DAX is not SQL. And what happens at that <laughs> point, you have a lot of verbose code and it's hard to understand what that code is doing. And also, Agreed. is the code doing the right thing? So there are best practices that we provide, which are, okay, if you write the code this way, maybe that you could rewrite the code this way. Sometimes there is a performance benefit, but we also uh, provide an information when you do something that, even though the performance-wise will not be very different, but you improve the readability of the code. So the code is easier to read, it's easier to maintain later. And also it's easier, imagine you write a formula today and you read your formula six months later or someone else reads your formula. Can you understand what was the, 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 the requirement? So mm -hmm. you can easily understand this way. So, okay, I want to obtain this result. I'm actually doing that calculation. We always say the simpler, the better. So probably shorter and simpler DAX code is usually better than longer DAX code that is uh, full of, uh, you know, elements that don't help understanding what is going on. And maintainability is strictly related to that because uh, if you create complex code, 
the complex code is harder to support by you because you I, I don't remember what i wrote two weeks before just to be clear uh, and so <laughs> that's also a way to help yourself but when you have a team if you create standards for the team these standards help the team to 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 work in a in a you know in a way that everybody writes code that other can understand because more or less we all use the same style that's uh, that's the idea and follow the okay, best practices yeah. so i mean you know the uh, a variable for results any kind of filtered tables get declared as a variable and you reference the name all the, all that readability practices uh, kind of yeah. becoming standardized yeah exactly so before we start with the with the demo so the idea is that we have a uh, uh, we have we need a way to collect the information that we need for the analysis. Then we execute the analysis. So the information are collected through a format that is called VPACs, that is a, a format supported by a number of tools. I will show you in a moment. Uh, then we perform the analysis with the DAX optimizer service. We receive suggestion about what to do. And then we evaluate the issues that are reported by DAX optimizer. Sometimes we have to change the code. Some other times we have what we call a false positive. We say, okay, we know that this part of the code is expensive, but it is what it is. We have to do that. We have to pay the price. That's okay. And at that point, once we complete this cycle, we can continue. We can deploy the changes, publish the new report, and then repeat the process again. Why should we repeat the process? Well, because we uh, added other measures and other tables, for example, because the model evolves. If there are no changes in the model, you don't have a reason yeah. to do that. But in the life cycle of a project, this could be something that you start not to do once you deploy the code the first time, but you do in an iterative way during the development. Why? Because we don't actually optimize a report. We analyze a model, evaluating all the possible measures. We, we don't do an analysis of a specific report. We do a complete analysis. We call this a static analysis. We don't actually run the report. We just analyze the code, but analyze also the model and the statistic we have about the tables and the columns to prioritize the effort. So we not yep. only provide a list of things to do, we also prioritize them in order of importance, like we will see in a moment. Mm. So what we're going to do, we're going to extract the VPEX file from a semantic model. We're going to send this to DAX optimizer to analyze it, and then we will uh, we will see how the the review process work. Okay. Excellent. Now let me move to um, let's start with Power BI. Let's see where is my Power BI here. Okay. So here is a model. This is the same model that is also available for in the samples because when you when you create a login when you create an account for DAX optimizer without paying anything, you have access to the um, samples and you can see the entire, the full experience that uh, that uh, is available. Because of course, providing, you know, your model means that you should already pay the service. So, so you can try the same thing that I'm gonna show you now. So when you have a model like this one, you have a number of tables and you have uh, um, rows in this table, right? For example, this one, let me see, okay. I have a uh, 2 million rows, uh, in this sales table. So it's just not a large table. Uh, it's not very large, but it's not even so small. And in this model, if I go to the diagram view, we have something like 151 measures. So the, the model has a large, relatively large number of measures, which means that which measure should I start to evaluate, right? Because if I have a problem, usually you have a problem in many measures. So, we tend to repeat our mistakes. So if if I made something yeah. that is not a bad a good practice, I tend to repeat this in all the measures. Now the problem is, should they fix all the 150 measures, or are there measures that are more important than others? Because uh, you know, if a measure mm -hmm. is used by many other measures and is used in loops in iterators, maybe it's more important. So that's the kind of analysis we're going to do. How do we start? So let's say that you have your model. Your model could be in Power BI Desktop or already published in the um, in Power BI service. Especially when you have incremental refresh and the data set on the service is bigger, you want to extract the VPAX file from the service. Now I will use the Power BI desktop just because it's easier. We can use one of the many external tools. I just show you a couple of them. Uh, Bravo for Power BI is probably the easiest way to extract the VPAX file. 
Um, this tool is a, is a free tool that you can download and install. And by clicking this button, you simply save in a file, in a VPAX file. So let me save this here. I, I save this file here. And this file basically contains the information about which tables, which columns you have, which size each column, each column has, exactly the same information that we have here. This is a visualization of VertiPack Analyzer. VertiPack Analyzer is a, a public open source library that mm -hmm. extracts this statistical information from a model and saves in a save this information in a format, VPAX, the VPAX file, which doesn't include any data from the model. You don't have the list of the customers or the list of the yep. products or anything. You just have the metadata. So the table name, the column name, and the definition of the measures. And for each column and each table, the, um, the number of unique values, the number of rows. These are the information that we collect. Another tool to do the same is DAX Studio. DAX Studio also has a better, vis a, not a better, a, a, a deeper visualization of the same information. If you go in advanced view metrics, you can see the same information here. We have a summary. We have the list of all the columns of the model, which is the what is the size of each column. You can see also the information here. And these are cardinality size. Uh, all this information are the same information we have seen before, just with a different visualization. And also, DAX Studio has this export matrix button that can save basically the same uh, uh, the same VPAX file that we saved before. So I don't need to save it again, just to, to give you all the options. And the third option is to use Tabular Editor 3, which is a commercial tool that already has the uh, extraction of the VPAX file and in the future will have also a deeper integration with DAX Optimizer, the service. Now, we have on our... Uh, file system, the VPAX file. What's yep. next? So the second step is that we go to the website. Let me open this. And let's let's start from the beginning. So let me close this. And let's go in DAX, to DAXOptimizer.com. So what happens when you go to DAXOptimizer? You have to open the app. So you go to AppDAXOptimizer.com. And at this point, you need an account for DAXOptimizer. Uh, you can create your account using any email, uh, email password, or you can use your work account. At this point, because I already logged in before, so I, I would probably, it's better if I show you this, uh, because uh, otherwise uh, you don't see the, uh, the picture at the beginning. So what we have at the beginning is this option. So we, we can create an account, register. If you already have email, uh, username, uh, sorry, email and password, you can use email and password, or if you have a work account, you can just use the work account. So you can like skip that it, uh, the registration. It, it connects to an Active Directory. That that makes exactly. things a lot easier. Now, yeah. Intra ID, Microsoft Intra ID, <laughs> formerly known as uh, Microsoft uh, Azure. It's gonna Active take Direct. me so it's long to to like start I mean, using that term. Yeah. It's a work account. Okay, work account is good because it's it's simple. Right? Work. So, it's a work account. Yeah. Office so called work, it yeah. this. Way. Work, so yeah. use work account. Yeah. We 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 struck for a while. Yeah. What to write in that button? You have no idea how much time we had to spend <laughs> to make this decision. But yeah. So work account is what I used uh, before, and now okay, I can skip this part. But basically, the first time you uh, log in with your account, you will create the account that corresponds to your work account on the ta on the Tabula Tool system. Dax Optimizer is a uh, is an application provided by Tabular Tools. So the account is a, a, an account for uh, Tabular Tools. So in the future, that if there will be other services, you will have all, only one account for Tabular Tools. Yeah. Now, once you are, uh, once you enter here, you see that you have workspaces that you can create. It's similar to Power BI. So the idea is that, okay, I have my workspace and my personal workspace where I can add a model. Adding a model means that I have to extract the VPAX file. I already did this, but you see here the instruction about how to do that. And once I have the VPAX file, I have to upload it to my um, to, uh, to my workspace. In this case, my personal workspace. So at this point, I choose which contra. Ah, oh, that's uh, funny because I might have. Hopefully, I have some contract available. That's uh, okay. That's uh, ha. Huh. That's embarrassing. So okay. So <laughs> <laughs> no this worries. is funny. 
because okay wait a minute uh let me just check if i can uh, remove a model so because uh guess what i have my license that is uh, so let me manage the licenses i i guess that i can remove so this way we also see some part that i would have shown later but basically the idea is that i'm i want to analyze a model and in order to analyze this model i i need a license right and uh, the license I'm going to use uh, is a license that I already have, but I already assigned before to some other model. So now I want to check whether I can, uh, let's see, let's see, active models, this one, individuals, I have to remove one uh, model from the active license, because basically I can keep uh, five models active at the same time uh, for the license yep. that I have now. Of course, you can get other licenses. Uh, this is just an example. If it is taken too much, sorry, I would go to the, the backup plan, which is uh, the worst place where I already uploaded that. I just wanted to show you uh, the example, but it's taking too long, probably because, uh, oh, here we go. Right. So yeah, we can remove this one and remove this one, and we are good to go. Fantastic. So it should be good. This one, no. That's uh, that could be a bug. Interesting. Yeah. One, one of so, them is turned off, which is a good thing. <laughs> yeah. No. I think that this one, this one is, should be enough. I'm just uh, wondering whether it's uh, why something happened. This could be a bug. <laughs> you see why we are we are in preview, right? <laughs> yes. Dark, so, so let me just uh, this is. Uh, Beautiful to to be uh, live because this way we can uh, experience uh, the crashes. Fantastic. Okay, so I'll let me. If you uh, have a different browser uh, with without the I cache, have, it might work. Yeah, no, no, but I have always. Uh, I have several uh, backups. Uh, backup, <laughs> yes, of course, it's not a problem. Uh, this one is. Here we go. Should work. Uh, yeah, the cache. Yes. Okay, so let's uh, go to the other one. Very good. As you see, not only Microsoft has bugs, also ISVs have bugs. Yeah. Developing software. Well, I've also is just hard. found uh, I've I've found that there's been times where even in just in Power BI, I've had issues with multi-tenant yeah. scenarios where even after I log in, I keep getting the splash screen to to log in to your oh, account yes. over yes, and, that's, and that's it, very... it is. It's very common. Yeah, it, very... it has me very annoyed sometimes on the 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 directory logins with stuff. But I yeah, I, yeah. I think that's just more of a caching and like that's a Microsoft issue. Yeah. Okay, so let's try right. again. So let me see if we have the right uh, 2020 managed license. I just want to check whether the active models is set correctly. Yes. It. Ah, uh, no. Yes. You see that it didn't inactivate this one. Now oh, it is okay, working. Now it is work. Yeah, because before it was not uh, responding timely. So now let's move forward. So I go here individual and I say, okay, this is, uh, I have two, two slots available and I can get my five here. So I go in the demo and I get my five here and I continue. So now this file is added to the system and now we're, we're using an, an, an Azure service and you didn't see the process, but actually when you create the account, you can choose in which region you want to be. So um, I don't remember in which region I am here, but I think I am in uh, uh, East US. So at the moment I'm in East US. Uh, we currently provide the three regions. One is in the US, uh, one is in Europe and one in Australia. We're going to increase the number of regions depending also on the demand, of course. Because this way you have the, 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 the data is, uh, you know, for legal reasons and also for performance reasons, the data is uh, closer to your, uh, to your country. Now that this uh, model has been uploaded, I have already some uh, information about the model. So the size the number of measures and so on. And I can say, okay, I want to analyze it. So in reality, there was a pre-validation of the model to make sure that we don't get an invalid model. You know, if you use a very old version of uh, DAX Studio, for example, you might have a VPEX file that is too old. And so we would say, well, use a newer version of DAX Studio, but you don't have to consume anything to do that. 
And when the model is complete, then we will get the, the information about the, 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 the analysis. Now, just because we don't want to wait uh, other minutes, I can uh, go where we already have the same information, the same model that I've shown you. And this is the, exactly the same model that um, I uploaded before. It, this is just created in a, a separate workspace. This is the sample workspace. The workspace mm -hmm. is like in uh, Power BI, something that you can create to share the information with other users. So if in your company, there are two, three people working in a team, okay. instead of getting the, the model in your private workspace, you can create a group, uh, sorry, you can create a workspace and you can process the model in the workspace and then share the workspace to other users. So you pay once, let's say for the analysis, but in reality, all the other users can see the data. The, um, we will talk about the payment data, but Basically, you pay only for the analysis, not for uh, reviewing the data that you already pro processed. Now, what happened? Out of curiosity, point... is I was just uh, just one little um, icon that I see where it says count groups are not analyzed. Um, I don't know if you'll be getting into that later, but uh, that that is one thing that I will be curious to to know some of the limitations on on why it wouldn't be because I would assume you would otherwise scan those if you if it was easy. So it's a. <laughs> Let, let's talk about this later because now we, sure. we, we want Absolutely. to see what we can do. So we have now a number of issues that have been found. And for example, these issues are have been already displayed here. And at the moment, these issues are just displayed by type of the issue and number of measures that have that issue. So what we are seeing here is that this problem exists yeah, sorry, no, this is another, so this is a problem, so this is already by measure, so I, I was thinking about the grouping, because you can group by issue this way, so if you group by issue, you see how many measures have each issue, but if I don't group, then I have one row for each measure, okay, and the standard visualization is this one, so I already shown you at the beginning the advanced visualization, the standard visualization is a simple one, where we say, okay, this is the what is the relevance for this issue? In other words, we provide like a score that tells me that this issue for this measure is more important than the others. Actually, these yep. two have the same level of importance and the other have much less. This number is not important by itself. It's just important as a relative comparison to the others. Once you fix the first two, the other ones will be more important too, right? Because uh, of course, uh, it's a question of orders of magnitude. Um, so their 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 actual can... value would change. Like the relevance of three would become if if contract transition wasn't there anymore, would become yeah. a different higher number. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. If we fix the first two, these numbers would be different because the, the number that is so you see only a few digits. But you see that not normalized value is the actual value behind that number. So the, the value that you see in the tooltip is actually the actual computation. So the differences are so wide. Is you have orders of magnitude of the difference. So the idea is that we show just a few digits, so to enable you to, to make a decision. Okay, where do I start? Start probably from the. Yep. Oh. Same information here. The difference is that here we we only see the issues. Here we see the 151 measures, and this could be important because think about this. You see that this is the expert view. The expert view shows you more details: the CPU and the RAM cost, and the possible optimization and the possible optimization for the CPU and the RAM. Now. A measure that does it, so the measure in green, the margin measure, doesn't have an issue, but it has a cost. So you can mm -hmm. actually, you can use this visualization to understand, okay, even though I don't have an issue, I know that this measure is expensive. Uh, maybe that we don't detect any particular problem. You wrote everything the right way, yeah. but that measure is still expensive. So this is uh, something that can help you to evaluate which part of the model could be expensive. But let's say that when you want to work just with the issues, you say, okay, I, I want to fix this. So what do you do? You click this. Now, once you click this, you see all the five measures that have this problem. And of course, now we select sales amount because we want to see, okay, this is the sales amount measure that is doing this calculation. We intentionally created some measure that has some problem without creating a too much complex uh, model. Now, what should I do? Well, I 
can see here the description of the problem and a few examples of the code I could change. So this is example one, example two, and we might find the case that is closer to the actual code we have. You have to write the code. We don't write the code for you because that would be too dangerous, to be honest. But you have information that guides yeah. you through the process of understanding what should I do here? What should I do to fix it, right? And so let's say that we, once we understand, okay, for example, in this case, uh, this is a context transition in iterator problem. And let's say that in this case, we, we, we can fix it. So we follow the description here. We go back to Power BI. And so let me go back to Power BI Desktop. So the measure was uh, sales amount. So if we search sales amount and we add a sales amount here, so I'm just using Power BI Desktop, I can change the code so that now I will remove this uh, row, uh, row amount from here so basically what i'm doing is that instead of doing this calculation if you think about what we are doing actually this is uh, something i could have wrote this way i could have wrote uh, i want to compute this measure because at the end i want to sum if i make sure that the row row amount is a sum pay mm -hmm. attention if i say okay what is row amount i can go here and i can see what is there and i can go back so Dax Optimizer okay. helps you navigating through the, 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 the hierarchy of calculations because in order to write the code I'm write, that I'm writing now, I have to make the assumption that the calculation that I have here is an additive measure. Because if it is not an additive measure, I have to go row by row doing this. What I'm going to do in this particular case, yes. I'm going to remove this condition so that I use calculate, but by using calculate, I had to make sure that row amount... Mm -hmm is an additive measure that actually will provide the same value. So I have yep. to make sure, oh, this is just a sum of sales. Fine, I can do that. If, if, if this condition exists, I know that I can do that. So now I can write the code this way. And probably I have to use key filters to do that. And yeah. you see the code that I wrote now. So let's comment the original code. So I translated this code into this one. Right, so this is the, mm -hmm. the, the the change that I made. If I go back to um, the suggestion that I had here, if we look at the suggestions provided, if I remember well, example four or example three, um, no, this is uh, uh, probably yeah, that that's another example because there there, there are two problems here. So the pro the context transition by itself is a problem, but it's not the only one. The second problem is this one. Some x, some x with if predicate on iterator column. So if you look at the examples here, you will find that the, the sum x with an if with a measure is actually what I had. So this is exactly my, my example. And if I look at the code here, this is exactly what I did. So I moved the measure in calculate and I moved this condition into a keep filters in calculate. This is what I did, right? So this is exactly, so basically, um, depending on the, we always try to detect the more common patterns that can be improved without uh, thinking too much, even though we always provide a few details about, okay, you can do that if this is true or not. So you have to spend some time looking at the code, but once you get used to it, you, you know, you learn by, by mistake, after a while you say, oh, oh this is, a, this yeah. is a, I, I know what to do. Now I made this change, okay, I made this change, but at, at, at this point I have to inform um, Dax Optimizer that I fixed this, mate. I mean, I mm. think mm -hmm. I fixed this, okay, I think I fixed, which means that I go here um, and I say, okay, I, I fixed this one. So I go, let's see. Mm -hmm. Is this one okay? Uh, probably here. So this is not working. It's interesting. Let's see what is it is just trying to scan the, the, the so, changes in the, in the yeah? File. I just have to. I just have to to change. Uh, I'm I'm thinking what I'm missing here now, because uh, when you okay, when I apply a change to a measure, then I have to say, okay, I fixed it or 
I want to ignore it. And ah, one of the I don't. Yeah. See, so, yes. So, and at this point, I just uh, try to understand why it is not working here because this is just a filter that I can change, but I, it is not working. The, um, hmm. I thought there was the, on the main page. There's a way to like click a checkbox next to the measure. Yes, and then, I know, um, I know, but yeah. it should be should be possible also from this uh, visual. Oh yes, but no, because uh, uh, sorry. Uh, I, I I opened this one, but you remember this is the the code, uh, the sample code, right? Ah, I, yeah, I yeah, yeah. Use, yeah. Uh, I, because I said I, I wanted to save time. I said, oh, let's do. So this is the actual code that I used uh, that I uploaded mm -hmm. before. The model is the same. So if I go here, you see that there now I can. Yeah. This is fixed, right? Because I know that I I fixed it, right? What does it mean? Now you see that the line disappeared, and of course I can always uh, I can always. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. filter show only those that have to be fixed or show everything what is the idea uh, let's say that i continue right and i go for example in refund amount and i should fix this as well but let's say that for a, for a moment let's say that i don't i don't think that i can change it so i want to ignore it what happens at this point now i will repeat the cycle right i will uh, deploy the model or just uh, repeat the process because let's say how can i make sure that my change actually work so we will repeat the process we will send the vpax file again and at that point what happens if i said i want to ignore an issue that issue will not be reported again unless i change the measure so the measure has like a fingerprint and so if the measure didn't change and you said, I want to ignore the issue. It means that it is what it is. This is uh, expensive or there, but I accept it. I don't want to change it. Okay. If I say I fixed it, then the, the next iteration, that measure will be analyzed again, because you said that you fixed it. Now I check it, right? And if, yep. it, if you fixed it, it disappears. If you've, the changes that you made, produce uh, the same or other issues, you will see those issues. So fix is a way to okay. say, I don't want to see this issue anymore, just in this version. Mm -hmm. Ignore okay. means I don't want to see this issue also in future version of the VPAX file of the model, uh, unless I made a change. If I change the code, well, I want to analyze it again because maybe that I made a change, so my assumption is no longer true. And there no. just might but not might not be a way given the shape of the model and the measure that yes it's an expensive measure but it kind of it has to be in that form like there's there's just not an easy way to tweak it so you ignore it sometimes you have to for example yeah. it is not the case of this uh, of this uh, model but the context transition in iterator oftentimes is a false positive for example uh, let's see if i have one here no we don't have one here but there are cases where the contest solution iterator is something that you have to do, right? For, I give you an example. If you have a measure that says, uh, give me the maximum revenues for each customer. So you want to get the maximum revenue by customer, max X, customer sales amount. If you have 1 million customer, you we will say, oh, look, this is expensive. And you are doing contest solution iterator. And you will yeah. say, I know, but it is what it is. However, there are other um, contest transitions that you can optimize. For example, uh, I don't remember if I have one here. I don't think so. But for example, we can see the examples of the contest transition iterator. The classic example, I think, is this one. Imagine you have a, if you have max, you have to iterate customer by customer. But imagine that you have a sum X that says for each customer, multiply the sales amount of the customer by the discount of the customer. The discount of the mm -hmm. customer is a column in the customer table. Well, you can write this the code this way, but you can also write the code this way. If you write the code the second way, it's less expensive because guess what? We are iterating only the unique discount percentages and we reduce the materialization yeah. of the model that is needed to perform the multiplication, for example. And so the results should be the same, but the uh, performance is very different. So it's always the same uh, concept, filter columns, not tables. And yeah. whenever you have a contest transition, you're actually filtering a table, in this case, the customer, whereas here we are filtering a column. So we filter 
we get the sales amount for the value of that discount percentage, just grouping all the customer together. This is more efficient when uh, when you have a customer. And this is just an example. So there are many of these things where you always have to look at how to, you know, the example gives you a few examples of the possible issue, but we recognize that that part of the code that we highlight uh, um, is affected by the problem that we are, are monitoring. So for example, in this case, this is the measure that is in an iterator, find a way to either move the measure out of it or reduce the cardinality of the iterator, use a column and so on. So there are possible techniques. Sometimes it is what it is and you say, okay, ignore. As long as you don't change the measure, you will never see that um, issue again, also in the future, also in future analysis. But if you change the code, of course, we will uh, show you the, the, the issue again because uh, you have to reevaluate what you did. Yeah. So well, this is the idea. measure at that point, yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. yes. The problem is we try to, if you change just the format, it's not a change, okay? So a change should be a change in the syntax. Um, changing the spaces and the line set, that doesn't matter. Okay, so yeah, comments okay. doesn't matter. So you have to change uh, something meaningful, uh, we, which is the, the, the complex part of DAX Automatics. DAX Automatics has to understand what you want to do without executing the code. So we don't execute the code, but we assume what the code will could do and, and, and mm -hmm. we try to evaluate the complexity. That's uh, the, the, the word that is... Uh, made by Dax Optimizer. And so what happens? Now, if, if I go back uh, uh, to the sample world through. So we started with uh, one model, we made an optimization, and then we uploaded a new model. Okay, so let's go in version one here. Okay, so this is the first version of the model that we um, had at the beginning after the first optimization. So just to make it clear we separate it in a different model but you see that you can upload new versions of the model over time what does it mean let's say that i now look at the issues that i have now you see that i still have issues and now i fix the issue one i fix the issue two and then i upload a new version so i go here so now you see that here we have a situation where we still have issues because we fixed the, the more important measures I go back to V1 just to show you that margin currency is here, is number three. You see number three, but the not normalized value is 391655. So it's actually a bigger number. If we fix the first two, because this is our goal, we want to fix the more uh, expensive measures and see what happens. Uh, I mean, your time is limited. If you imagine when you have uh, 1,000 measures to fix, what do you do? you fix five, <laughs> 10 measures, and you try to yeah. fix the, the more expensive one. But then, and hopefully, that already fixed your slowest report. But then you want to move forward, and then you say, okay, now, next step, look at that. We want to fix uh, these other two that have a different value, because uh, remember, the value not normalized now is the, actually the value visible. And now we continue the process uh, by saying, oh, I want to, this, this, uh, these uh, three have been ignored, for example, because we said, no, this, it is what it is. Margin currency, it is what it is. Uh, we cannot optimize it, right? So we, we said, okay, that's okay, but we, we, we don't want or we cannot optimize. For these other three, we uh, we said, okay, we, we made an optimization. So we went into the code and we rewrote the code so that it is optimized now. And then we go to version three which is the version where we optimize everything. As you see, after we optimize everything, if we show everything, remember, you can always uh, show only the issues that have to be fixed, but when you show everything, you only see the remaining issues that we still find, and this is the version three, but you decided to ignore these three issues. So uh, at this point, that's the reason why when you go here, you see, great, verified, because we no longer have, you no longer have open issues. All the issues have been closed. Either you have fixed them or you ignored them. 
If you fix them to make sure that you actually fix them, you should do another run, another analysis, just yeah. to make sure that it doesn't appear anymore. Because if you say, I fixed it and it is not true, it will appear again. Or maybe it, there will be a different one. I don't think I'll ever be able to put a model into here that will probably get no issues found <laughs> unless I have actually ignored or, or fixed every single one of them. Um, but I, I guess that's the, that's the end result is you've either confirmed I can't do anything with it or it's already had a fix and you, you, you get to that end result. Yeah. The, this issue in particular, the contest resolution iterator. So that, yeah. that was a hard decision because uh, let's take a look at, uh, I don't know. So what is a contest solution iterator? Well, sometimes you, you have to, as I said before, if you have, um, if, if we show this one, so if I, let's go to the version one, oh, I think in the, the example that I shown you before, so let's uh, go here. I, I show you one, one example. If you look at this example here, not this one, the, I don't remember. There was another one. It was, uh, uh, probably it was in this version, this one. I remember there was an example where I could have used the, I know it was the context transition. Let me think, no, it was this one, this one. Let's say that you have this, this example, okay? You have a, a problem here, right? And, and you have uh, the issue probably with a high relevance because the customer is a big table and, and so the cost for that is big. Now you write the code this way guess what? You still have a content solution in an iterator. What is the difference? Yeah, yeah. Now the cost is much smaller. However, the issue is still there. It is just uh, down the list. So probably it's no longer the first one is at the bottom. Now, if you want to fix everything, you reach a point where you have to decide what do you want to do with this? Or imagine mm -hmm. that you have only this measure in your model. This is the, the measure that we report. We say, oh, this is a content solution in an iterator. This is the cost. What do you want to do? You look at the code and you say, I cannot do anything. So you ignore it. It's no, it's correct to ignore an issue, right? It's, it's not, the, but you have to know that you don't have any alternative other than doing that or to pre-calculate everything in another table. I mean, there is always a, another way, but let's say that sometimes you just have to say, and we did, we made this decision because the alternative was to arbitrarily decide to not show something, but what is the limit? where we decided this is this is good and this is not good. Based on what? Based on the fact that there is a column. Well, but if the column has a lot of unique values, it's still an issue. Maybe that you can round True. the discount percentage by the first decimal point, for example, and you get an improvement. In that case, maybe the, the, the solution is not to change the tax code, but to change the model and to round the, the percentage, for example, and just, and just inventing it. So th there are different approaches that you could have. So we decided that it's always better to show a false positive than having a false negative. False positive means that you have an issue That's, that is not okay. an issue. And we prefer this rather than hiding a potential issue. If, you see, if we see something, we show something. That's, that's the idea. As you said, like it, it's erring on the side of safety when it comes to that. Yep. Um, I actually have a couple of good questions that are um, popped yeah, up. Of course. So from James, why is it? Normally it should just show up on video. Oh, here we go. Send, send a screen. Um, so James had a question on, as his model size grows over time, new bottlenecks may arise. Will the optimization be doing again? So basically does the size of the yeah. model in any way determine what the recommendations are? That's an interesting question because, uh, my answer is yes and no. Let, let, let me explain. This could change in the future, right? Because of, so the current version of DAX optimizer, look at the DAX code and uses the statistics. So the granularity, the number of rows, the, the density of the columns as a way to provide a score to the issue. But the issue exists because you wrote the code in a certain way, right? 
Now, if you re imagine you remove all the issues, right? If you remove all the issues of your model, just because the model grows, you will not see an, a new issue unless you have a change in the model. In other words, just the fact that the data grows doesn't justify an issue that was not an issue before. What could happen is that you decided to ignore an issue because at that time, the table was very small. You had only two customers. And now that the table has 2 million customers, you are in trouble, but you decided to ignore the issue. We don't track this change at the moment. So if something changes in the distribution of hidden issues, that's something that today we don't, we don't track. We could, that's a good idea, but to be very, very transparent, at the moment, this could be an issue. So if you actually have something that appears as an issue later, then you could be in trouble. That said, if you wrote the code in a wrong way and you decided to ignore without fixing the issue, in part, this is on you because if we, we try to warn you, I mean, this code should be changed, right? And so if the code was uh, potentially exposing a dangerous behavior, you, in any case, you had an, uh, an, uh, a warning before. That's fair. But that's fair. a good point. So that's yeah. uh, that's something we should keep in mind. In the future, we could improve that because actually we know that. So we, we could reevaluate mm -hmm. or we could uh, highlight an issue that was ignored, but we could realize, well, but the statistics changes so much that you might want to reevaluate. That's a good point. That's a good point. Excellent. Let me, and if, if I don't know if you had something else you wanted to cover. Otherwise, there was a couple of other questions that have, uh, that have popped up um, if we wanted to continue on. The Q yeah, I just, I uh, just, uh, just a couple of minutes or so we close this one. So yeah. I just go back sure, one sure. slide. So uh, basically, the that's the idea. So VPAX analysis evaluate issue deploy changes, right? So this is this should this could be a loop. But let's think about what what is the 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 way. So when do when do you use DAX optimizer? There are two approaches. One is that you use it and, uh, as an emergency medicine. So <laughs> I have a slow report. I don't know what to do. I use DAX Optimizer. And DAX Optimizer, because it prioritizes the slowest measures, it's likely to show you a bottleneck in your model. Now, pay attention. If you have a one slow report and you have 1,000 measures, we don't know today which measure are used in your report. And so we analyze the entire model. Usually we find slow measures in any case, but if your model uses a measure that are down the list and are not in the top 20, you might not realize which measure you have, because maybe that there are other reports that are much slower, but they are less important and you don't realize that. So that's something that we want to improve, of course, but at the moment, the idea is that we don't want to do an analysis for based on a single report. Why? Because the second way to use DAX optimizer is to uh, use DAX optimizer as a preventive tool to keep the model in shape. So yeah. if I introduce DAX optimizer as part of the development process, basically during the development, I find a small number of issues, I fix them, and I can and I continue this way. It's important, of course, that during the development, you have a relatively good distribution of the data, even though it's simple, sample data, because if you work with a very small data model with just a couple of rows, then you don't get good advices. Um, so it, the best would be working with the sample of the data maybe, but still with the relative good distribution, even though maybe you have 10 times more the data in the real model, but the distribution of the data in the model that you have is similar to what you have in production. So that would be the, the important thing. Because otherwise you have just a different prioritization of the, of the issues that is not uh, what you want. Um, of course, we suggest to uh, use this as a preventive tool, but you can also use a, a, as an emergency tool. It's just that you have at that point it could be useful to go to the list of the measures where you also where you have all the measures and if you know which measure you use in the report you try to match those in the future we will do something to make it easier to 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 do this process but remember 
We don't run the report. We do a static analysis. We simulate what could happen when you go in production. We don't know the actual yep. filter that you apply to a report because we don't have the data. So, but but well, the, the, these me. bad patterns are, are are at the model level. Like I mean, it doesn't matter what visual or what size to a degree. Like it, this will, it's it's a problem that exists and it will only get worse the bigger your model is. And yes, with a lot of this stuff. So like you don't need to know the visual that this is being used in. Universally, yeah. this is just right. a bad right. practice. Right. The, you can imagine, this is the version one. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of ideas of other things we can do uh, for many things, because actually this is just the beginning in our opinion. But of course, we think that we reach the level where it worth the, the, the effort to use this tool because it saves you time and money, to, to be honest. Yeah. So even though it will not find everything, okay? Let's set the expectation right. Will it be able to solve a performance bottleneck in a complex model where hundreds of experts already work? No. I, I hope no, because otherwise the experts have nothing. Yep. But it's so fast and so easy that, and, and by the way, it finds uh, something that is not uh, obvious uh, most of the times. So, I mean, we were surprised when, when we tested it, we were surprised to find something that I said, oh, I. I would have spent hours to find that this measure was so important. Because the problem is that sometimes you don't realize that a measure that is down the evaluation path is actually creating an issue to many other measures. This is something that is hard to detect without an automated tool. Yes, you can start Agreed. from the report and you do the analysis. We have a course, <laughs> yeah. uh, Optimizing DAX, 40 hours of videos explaining you how to do this op optimization but at the end of the day, if the tool can do this in five minutes, why not? I mean, <laughs> even though I know how to do that, the first thing I do, okay, let's open with DAX Optimizer. Let's see what DAX Optimizer finds. So I save my time. And of course, if 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 there is still something to do, okay, let's start. But at that point, I, I removed a lot of things that I can automate. So that's the, that's the idea behind that. Okay. Uh, before we go to the question, um, just two things. Today, we are still in public preview. We started the private preview mm -hmm. in July. Uh, we went in public preview in uh, October, which means that you can use it. And we there is a discount for using it because actually we know that it is still not uh, in the GA. Uh, hopefully soon, but for sure in the first half of 2024, I hope sooner than that, we will have the general availability and uh, um, what is missing for general availability. Well, the latest feature that we Im Im implemented uh, are the sample world through. So today, without having any, um, just by you creating an account, you can use the UI. You can see uh, the, the 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 information. And if you, if I I think I, th I think if I click here, uh, this here, nope, sorry. I hope that I have. Uh, I wanted to show you that we have a nice. I just have to find. Let's go to. Optimizer.com. Uh, here, the sample world through. So, if you want to explore DAX Optimizer, my suggestion is to follow this instruction. When you create the account, you have a link to this page, and here you have a detailed instruction about how to activate the sample. You can download the sample, so you have the file, the local file. You can you can repeat the pretty much what I shown you in more detail and we also have a, a guide about all the steps uh, step by step uh, which uh, oh, um, nice. which change to make to every step so i mean it's very detailed and of course we will produce videos too but we just waited to produce videos because we wanted to stabilize the ui to that, 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 that because we didn't want to record a video again and again and again uh, we made I'll a number of the, the link to the people in the chat here as well that you're showing there you go yeah, yeah. Uh, and and yeah, and, and so you can you can go here and you can create an account, follow the links. Uh, there is the documentation is still not complete, but most of the things are already available. Now, one thing that we released and it is not documented yet. Sorry, no, the share the share workspace. This this has been released months ago. So when I create a workspace, I can share with other users. Nobody has to pay anything. Groups is a new feature that we just released. We didn't announce yet because we still have to complete the documentation. And okay. it's a feature that allows, it's very similar to the shared workspace. The difference is the following. The shared workspace, you have one user that is uh, 
the owner of the license and that user process the model. The other users can only read. With the hmm. group, okay. you can do another thing. You can assign the license to the group. So if you have five people, those five people share the license. And so anyone can nice. run the analysis on the model, which for a team that works on the same model is wonderful. The last feature we want to release before going GA is the model anonymization. What does it mean? Imagine you, so the VPAX file has all the names of the tables and the columns and the measures in yep. clear. We're going to release a feature that will, uh, let's say, translate all these names into complete uh, unreadable names. There will be a dictionary to translate this that you have to keep safe, right? So it will be a little mm -hmm. bit more inconvenient to use this feature because if you think about that, instead of having something that just works, you have <laughs> to keep a file locally. But if you, you know, depending on the level yeah. of power that you have, you we will provide this feature too. And of course, we will try to make it easier to use. But the thing is, if you want to be safe, you cannot provide you know this dictionary to the to the to the cloud because otherwise unless we encrypt it but that's it, you you have to trust it so we want to provide options so this is something we're working on it uh, we're working on now and once I this remember is your tweet about that uh, something like hey if, if if you had the ability to anonymize your your DAX, would this be something people would like um so i, I guess that that was alluding to to this in the okay I was wondering it, it why was you were, you're was, like, yeah, you were asking about that. It was related. It was related. Yeah, it was related because it's yeah. something that we, we, yeah, we wanted to to explore a little bit. Uh, okay. Now, uh, how does it cost? Well, there are two models. One is the consumption. I run analysis. I pay for that analysis. That's it. Okay. This is the model. You pay for each analysis. You want to save money. You just buy, you know, more it's like you, you get the coins or tickets and you spend one ticket in each analysis, you get the 100 tickets, you spend less. That's one option. The second option, subscription. You get a subscription and you can run analysis, multiple analysis day by day. Actually, you can run probably more analysis that you can actually consume because we have a limit of 20. However, this depends, of course, on the pricing page that you can find in uh, Tabular Tools uh, DAX Optimizer. I just show you this uh, page just to show you that the the, the basic the, the starting point is forty five dollar per analysis consumption model. That now that we are in in, uh, in beta in public beta, it's a uh, discounted thirty percent. The subscription is if you run two analyses per month, the subscription is more convenient. That's the idea. So. Usually, I mean, we, we try to move people to the subscription model, but of course you can decide to do something else. And if you run the subscription, you have to choose uh, how many models yep. you want to keep in your subscription and, and so on. So you will find many other details here. I don't want to, uh, you know, this is something that you have to evaluate depending on the business, depending on the size of the team, uh, there could be several options. But remember also for a big model, you want to, to, to do a single run, it is 45 that now is $30. So basically, that's the cost for a full analysis of a model that you have, and all, regardless of the number of measures and the number of tables and so on. Because this is something we discussed long, but we didn't find a way to, because we, we, we wanted to keep a model simple. So basically saying, yeah. oh, the cost depends on the number of measures that you have, it, it would have been a nightmare. What I mean, and like, it's the same thing that I, the reason that I pay for the the measure killer is like, I mean, if I can save myself hours and hours and hours of work, yep. it's it's easily worth the cost of whatever that's going to be because I've just saved myself eight hours of model review um, with, with all of that. But yes, questions, I have a good number spun up, so I will go ahead and start. I, here. I, I um, think that I, I think that the the. Um, uh, the opportunity of using the the, the 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 tool depends on the on the value that your model has. Yeah. So, for example, if I have a Power BI desktop model that works well, why? I mean, <laughs> would you? The, the question is, would you pay Scale. a consultant to review the model? That's the question, right? Would you? Because mm -hmm. if you want to pay a consultant, wait a minute. Do you know a consultant that will do the analysis for less than forty bucks? 
That's the question, right? So that, that's the, the simple question. If you think that you will not do this analysis with a consultant, there is no, there are no reasons to use DAX optimizer because basically you don't see the value for that kind of optimization. Uh, at the same time, uh, if you are willing to hire a consultant to uh, do the analysis, it could be smart to do this before he comes into the. I mean, I, I uh, am a consultant. I I do use this honestly. Like, I mean, it, it's I, I, I can do this and bill the client for six hours of my own review, or I just know immediately where should I look first. Part of this is just telling me what to what measure to look at first, yeah. and that's hard to do outside of literally clicking on every measure, seeing the dependencies. Like, you know, there's no yeah. no expertise can do that faster for you. You can just read the measure faster, but you still have to review every single measure oh, yes. to know. The priority so it's yeah it's it, it's a time saver internally or externally regards regardless of who you yep. are um but yeah let, let's get to some of these questions here so the yeah of course i'm, I'm um I, I, yeah I peter had a great one so i'm gonna i'm gonna send this up uh peter nicholson um if i'm referencing other measures with a measure does it take the whole context of all yes, of its of dependencies and 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 that or does it just do the the top level one of course, that's <laughs> that's the entire point of the the entire point is that when you uh, for uh, uh, can I show you one thing? So if we go back to the uh, let's see here, um, when we go, you see this uh, this column, right? Okay, so. What are these two columns? This is the direct references and indirect references, which means that basically we gives you uh, an idea about how often this measure is used in other measures. 56 times the sales of the, this measure that is called show value for dates, six, this, this show value for dates measure is uh, evaluated directly 56 times but in an indirect way, because if you have a measure that calls this measure, but another measure called the measure that calls show measure, this is indirect reference, right? And so you can see that we actually consider this as a part of the evaluation for the relevance. But <laughs> I cannot describe you how long was the process to understand how to balance everything, because it's important to have the, the reference, but the reference itself it depends. It depends on the cost of each step and the, and, the, and the relative cost for the other measure. And for example, another thing that we do, if a measure is slow, but the cost is because of the measure that you call internally, mm. from our point of view, is the internal measure you have to optimize, not the external one. Okay. And that's uh, and that's uh, the, the the and this evaluation is uh, is complex. Believe me, it's complex. No, oh, that's uh, yeah. They, uh, a bit of the mechanics I think is very helpful as this does the evaluations for sure. Uh, let's yep. see. So we got. I'll throw up another one. Um, yep. We did that. Did that. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I'll go to DAFs. Bring this up. Uh, might have he might have missed this, but uh, how are poorly constructed measures identified and parameterized? Is it purely based off of the formula engine and storage engine performance, or are there multi segmentations on expected behaviors? So <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> it's years of work. Yeah. It's no, no. <laughs> it's years of work. So there is no, let's say there there are there are no sequ there, there are no shortcuts. What we do is we get your measure, we expand the measure, we evaluate the, the entire execution tree. We found anti-patterns within the execution tree at different levels. We evaluate them because for each part of the evaluation tree, we compute the possible cost from memory and CPU point of view. Remember, we have no idea about the former engine and storage engine because we never execute the code. And the same code could use the formula engine or the storage engine, depending on other variables that depends on the execution context. So it's impossible to predict what the actual execution plan will be. Okay, this is not possible, especially for us. Uh, what we can do, though, is that based on the code you wrote and the algorithm that you are ex exposing, 
we know the potential cost that that algorithm has, right? And okay. this is possible. So we, we, of course, in order to do that, we had to provide a cost to everything just from a syntactic point of view. Mm. And we had to make sure that this matches the real cost in execution environments. Okay, it yeah, that's fair. A few years of work to do this. So it's not something. I imagine, we... yeah, the, the amount of patterns that had to be analyzed and then coded to, to identify this is, uh, it was a lot of effort that I'm yeah, putting in. Yeah, that's, well, the, the problem was to create the framework to enable this because the, the real issue, the, the longest development time was to, um, to create the infrastructure to compute the cost of each mm -hmm. node in the syntax tree. That, that's, uh, I'm not saying that the rest is easy, <laughs> but it's, uh, without that cost, it would be impossible to react because you could, yeah. you could identify the patterns, but providing the, the, the score, uh, not possible. The problem was that if, when we imagine this tool, if we just provided the list of all the issues that you have, imagine the situation, you have a slow report, you open the model, you have 1000 measures, and you see that you have 1000 issues. What do you do? You close everything. You don't do anything. I mean, there is nothing you can do. If everything is wrong, you cannot do anything. So you need a way to start. You need a way to say, okay, what is the priority now? What is the first thing I have to fix to get the most the more benefit in my model in most of my reports. This is the the the, the approach that we made, and I, mean, I know that it works. Well, yeah, yeah. Like as I tell most people, honestly, is the uh, there's there's only a few blogs that I that I recommend usually as gospel, so to speak, and SQL BI is one of the few. Is like if, if you read something there as a good practice, at least as the, at the time that that article was written, ninety nine point nine percent chance that is the correct way to do something and they will add an edit at the top if it ever changes in the future so you, you guys yeah. are yeah, both yeah. very very good at just like yeah t take this word as gospel for this is what you should or should not do it with dax yeah um kevin or keith had a article actually about location a bit for where your stuff is being ran so if, if he was in canada and using your services at all currently what region with this currently we have only one region for america so Canada okay. is East US, but uh, the good news is that first, depending on the demand, we can open new region. That's not an issue. Second, if a okay. company is big enough, there, were, there will be no problem because uh, we have a way to deploy. It's too early now, but we plan to have deployment also in a government um, region. Mm. So, you know, those regions that are for, you know, for government yep. level. So uh, we're not there yet because we still have to complete the, the, the GA and other things, but, but we, we have a system, uh, an infrastructure that allow us to deploy to new region in, uh, in, an, in an easy way. It's just a question of, I mean, mm -hmm. why you don't deploy to all the region? Well, there is a cost for each region, so it is not free, but, but th there is no overhead from our point of view. To manage more regions so it, it should okay. be easy perfect just ask good to know send, for, send for an email yeah, exactly and then, and then an email for you guys let's see i got that done and i will pop this one up from evan uh Presson as well so he wants to know will the integration with analysis services to more easily export import to the vpax cloud come thank in the future? you thank you for the question yes <laughs> there are two things we want to do um at the beginning, we wanted to do this for GA. Now we postponed it, but we will do that for sure. Two things. One, we want to have an application to um, to do the job, right? So imagine you have an app like, like Bravo for Power BI, something that you install on your computer and manages uh, uh, the extraction from the VIP, the extraction of the VIP file, send the VIP file, and for example. The anonymization, right? Because if you if we include the anonymization, we have to to we have an additional layer of complexity to manage because you have this dictionary that you have to manage somewhere. Number two, expect a deeper integration with Tabular Editor three. So if you yeah. have Tabular Editor three, you will have within Tabular Editor 
the issues and you double click and you go to the major within the same environment. So you, you still have a service, but remember you pay for the analysis. Yeah. The fact that you have a website to navigate the result of the analysis is just a service we provide for free. You can download the VPAX file with the information that is the result of the analysis and work offline. It's not available yet, but once you will have this integrated with Tabular Editor, or once we will have the, our application, this will be possible. So we, you will have the offline experience that you have seen now, because basically the, the information can be also used locally. There is no reason. Imagine you are on a plane and you want to fix your measures. I mean, you could watch a, a movie, but if you want to use a, a DAX optimizer on a plane without the internet on a connection, tiny laptop, it would be yeah. possible once we have the application. Okay. Excellent. I mean, yeah, it, I mean, it's just running through through a series of scripts to, for all this detection, so it doesn't always have to be cloud-based, I would imagine. Uh, let's see, pop up a couple of others here as well. So we, uh, one other um, from Sahil, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Uh, should we use keep uh, the keep filter pattern over uh, our typical filtering pattern for simple filtering over uh, columns of a table? No, it depends. Uh, it depends. <laughs> key filters changes the semantic of what you're writing. When I use yep. key filters, uh, when I optimize the code, or when you see when you see key filters used in uh, samples of code optimization, it's basically a way to keep the same semantics, the same meaning of the measure. Yep. So if you have this measure, and you change the measure, for example, I had a measure that had an if, and I wrote the measure with a calculate, and I moved the condition in the if in the calculate statement. In order to keep the same semantics, I had to use key filter, because otherwise, an existing filter in the report over the same column would have been mm -hmm. overridden once I used calculate. Whereas in the previous version, the filter was applied after the filter was applied to the report. So. Yep. Sometimes changing the way you write the DAX code changes the way the evaluation is made. And when this happens, if you want to keep the consistency with the previous version, you have to pay attention to the translation. So this is the reason why you have seen key filter, but key filter was not there for a performance reason, it was there to keep the same behavior of the original measure we had to optimize. Okay, no, no, that context is very helpful. Um, and I think one other that's, in here, another one from Evan. Uh, will there be an API endpoint that's developed where they can send DAX measure code and receive optimized <laughs> code? I mean, so part of this, is I think you already hit on the idea that you're, you're not actually rewriting the code yet. You're providing recommendations, but not actual code you can copy that's optimized. Exactly. So um, that's dangerous, right? It, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not saying, so never say never. Um, the, the problem is the following, the, we have to find a way, uh, first of all, we have to, you know, justify what we did so far. So if we don't have, we, I mean, we have to see whether the people actually use the, the, the tool, because uh, at the end of the day, we're betting that people will uh, love the tool and will use the tool. But if this doesn't happen, it doesn't make sense to continue to invest on a tool that people don't use. Right. So this is the first, uh, so once we go GA, we also want to see the return and the feedback. Potentially, uh, there are several things we can do. There are cases, limited cases, where you we could rewrite the measure, right? And and there are cases where we could be safe. Other cases where we could be confident, but we will need approval. Other cases where we actually okay. have no idea about what to do. So, how do we manage these three cases? How do we manage the interaction with the user? That's a complex. Uh, question. Um, we have ideas, we have uh, potential features to develop, but it, it depends. It depends because it depends on the kind of feedback we receive once we have numbers or, or, and, and, and we see the collective feedback. For example, will the tool be used more by newbies with small models or only by people that have thousands of measures? This changes the perspective of the, the kind of uh, um, features we want to prioritize. Ideally, we have both, and we have to develop features for both. But, but the idea is that we want to automate many processes that now we do manually when we provide consulting or we, we help other people writing DAX code or optimizing DAX code. 
Um, for example, one thing that we will lie, I would love to do is to apply the same concepts to the model. Because sometimes, I mean, most of the times, a good model just removes the need for DAX code. Yeah. But sometimes you have to keep the model. So is the model good enough? Is there something we have to do to the model? That's another level, right? So that, that that's another, I mean, again, we are, we have well, ideas maybe, there. But... Like, yeah, like from the measures deriving the fact that there's a problem with the model and instead of making a measure recommendation, it's like, well, if you change the model to this, you like you're not going to need a cross fill, a cross join, or whatever this might be, because the model has been optimized now. So, but like but that the, probably that, is all the extra yeah. layers are complex to do that. The the issue is that your input is the model, right? Your input, you have yeah, no yeah, idea, model. no idea about what is the meaning of what you are reading. So, that's the problem. So, any mm. decision on the model is usually based on assumptions that you can make by interviewing your customer or your user. Now, that said, there are a few things that can be done. Uh, for example, if the goal is not to fix the model, but the goal is to detect potential issues in the model, like the measure, right? So we don't fix the measure today. We provide you suggestions. We, we identify the problem. We Even just the fact that we can identify the slowest measures in the report, in the model, it, it, it's good. It's great. I mean, that's I, still a lot, yeah. Now, it, we could do something similar for the model. Uh, if you have uh, 50 tables, okay, you're, you, you might have a bad model, I, but in reality, <laughs> there are part of the model that should be fixed before anything else. It's the same principle of the, of the, of the measure, right? So you have 1,000 measures, but those 10 measures are the, the big priority you have. Well, for the model, we could do something similar. Uh, another thing we could do we could also prioritize the measures based on the reports that you have. Today, we don't know the report that you have, so we, we have no idea. But if we know more, something more about the report that you have, we might know which columns you filter uh, and a few other things. So we could say, okay, if you're not, for example, if you're not using these measures, okay, this could be bad. But if you have a measure that is very bad, but nobody uses, <laughs> should you optimize it? Maybe yes, but not today, right? And, and that's well, look, be... it's the that that's the not the low-hanging fruit, but it, it's something that should be fixed, but less prioritized versus the stuff that's used. Exactly. Yeah, you might yeah. have another another element to evaluate the score, which is uh, consumption usage, right? So, if and, and the other thing is a measure uh, could be good, but it become it could become very slow if you filter using a column in this table. Something that's eight relationships away, bi-directional, all sorts of like nasty stuff. Yeah. Like, but the, the measure is perfectly coded, but the model exactly. sucks. Yeah. Now the problem is when you have a bad model, you have uh, like uh, millions of possible combination of relations that could go wrong. So what do you do? You, do you fix everything? Do, do, do you say, because the, the, the easy answer is use the star schema. Okay, fantastic. But now sure, I have yeah. this crappy model with 100 tables. There is no way I can create a star schema tomorrow. So is there yeah. one thing I should focus today that I could try to fix to improve the, the thing? Probably yes. Yeah, the, so the, the idea is if you, if you change the goal, the goal is not to fix, I mean, fixing everything automatically, no way helping you to find something you can do today to improve something tomorrow well we yeah. can work it so the, and and we could do this for the model as well as we did for the measure because for the measure we did this basically i have a uh, one last question from evan and we'll use this to to wrap up today so and he actually provided one follow-up comment um which, which helped give context so when you combine both the model and dax optimization and by model he's referring to basically the veritapack analyzer or any BPA type stuff and do a single tool that will just give a holistic recommendation to both things to improve in the model, but also things to improve with DAX. Ideally, yes. To, today, yeah. just, just one thing. So BPA, the best practices analyzer, I mean, is good, but it's, uh, uh, it's not something we want. So we could use something 
but actually the problem I have with BPA is that is too much and many rules don't apply to many scenarios. So the issue is that you should identify, okay, are you designing a model for a big company, Fortune 500, uh, thousands of users, or are you designing a Power BI desktop file that 10 users will see and use? Yeah. And in the middle, you have a number of other things. That's one. <laughs> yeah. thing. Second, which standards do you use? There, there are rules in BPA. I mean, BPA is an engine, and then there are rules, and we have uh, hundreds of rules. But you should, to be honest, you should decide which rules you want for you and then follow them. Well, but yeah, now these exactly. rules uh, by themselves, they don't optimize anything. They, they are just, you know, potentially best practices if you yeah. decide that that is what you want to do. For example, a naming convention is subjective. Mm. To be honest, the naming convention I could <laughs> like, it could be different. I, I'm sure 100% that what I like, Alberto doesn't like. So we already have a problem <laughs> internally with two people. We don't agree. So, uh, so the rules that could be objective, we can talk, right? So that, that, that are the rules. Now, BPA works only on the model without considering the actual data that you have or, or the measure or the semantic of the measure that you have. So yeah, yeah. when I think about optimizing the model, I'm thinking about something that is uh, just uh, something more than what BPA does, because what BPA does, I mean, it's already there. It's free. It's open source. You can use it. So what we could what we could do, we could use a few rules if they are relevant. But to be honest, the, the, the more important, the more interesting part is to analyze the actual distribution of the data and to enter into the merit, okay, you have a bi-directional feed, they're fine. But maybe it's not a big issue, right? So it, it depends. Yeah. The, there are <laughs> things that are, I can, it, it's, it's the same thing we said before. You might have a 100 violation of the best practices. Which one is more important? BPA doesn't do that. It cannot. It, it doesn't have a way to prioritize anything. And so if we want, once we yeah. include the feature that work on the model, we certainly want to do something that is integrated with everything else. And yes, it will be part of the same. We will not create another tool for that. So we we don't want Makes to, sense, yeah. there is no, no reason. There are no reasons to, to, to just get the BPA as it is. Whatever we do is something that should not require other additional decision, right? So, because we should make the decision for you because otherwise why you were paying uh, for, for a tool. <laughs> Uh, one thing that you, you mentioned at the beginning, I forgot, but I wanted to, you highlighted that DAX Optimizer today works with measures only and doesn't optimize calculation groups oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. role uh, level security. Uh, so let me describe this. Yep. These are two different problems. Um, the security is uh, potentially an easier problem to solve. The issue we have with both is that those elements will be combined with any calculation, any report. And so if you want to do the same kind of detailed evaluation we do for the measures, we simply cannot. The, the number of combination is just uh, too big to, to be affordable. What we can do, do though, is uh, we can do two things. We can First of all, analyze the DAX code because uh, analyzing the, the DAX code without the statistics is something we can do. Yep. And we can recognize anti patterns in DAX code in both. This is something we can do. The second thing we can do for the, uh, for the um, security filters, there could be specific um, rules that we could implement that don't apply to generic measures. Uh, because what you write in a in a security filter is something that will be injected into any storage engine query. And so with this assumption, we can make a few evaluations that otherwise would okay. not make sense otherwise. Uh, again, it, it should be a specific word for the security filter. For the calculation group, unfortunately, uh, the, I, I don't think there is a way or actually 
never say never. Let's say there is a way to evaluate the calculation groups in specific reports. This is possible. So yep. if I have a report and I know that there is a calculation item selected in that report, I could make some decision. But at that point, we create the more a model that, that optimizes a single report. This is not our goal. So yep. what we can do, we can evaluate whether in the calculation item there is some, uh, let's say, bad practice that is applied. Filtering but over we, sales, back table able... or something. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is that when you when you have the selected measure, we are used to evaluate a measure considering the entire execution yep. tree. So we, we expand all the measure. When we see selected measure, we cannot do anything. So I, st I don't, I don't know. We will fair. do something. In, yeah. in, after, after GA, we will do something for the calculation. For version two, yeah. We have a few you know, options. We still have to evaluate what to do because the issue is that it also impacts the UI and the user experience because uh, it's not something we can say fix or ignore like we did before. We, we have to think about uh, something specific. We cannot mix calc measures and calculation items for sure. Yep. They should be diff they should be in different um, in different uh, lists at the minimum. No, this is this has been absolutely fantastic. I think we got to get a great deep dive and walk through on that. And uh, yep. I appreciate a lot of the the good technical questions that we got, especially from you, Evan. Um, yep. One final thing, and I do actually have to run to another client call, but. Um, Evan, uh, Preston just had a final question on, is there any trials um, or anything related to like just testing it once or, or anything before you actually have to purchase? <laughs> there, I think the there is some the, people were mentioning trial, it that used the, to be back in like October. The issue is the follow. So we, 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 we created the sample walkthrough because the trial, yeah. so one run will find all the issues that you have. Yep. So the, the question is, I ask you, so, you have this tool that one you can pay once the tool and that's it it's over okay you, you don't need it. to be honest once you identify the, the problems the fact that you analyze a model and you find no issues has a value right because yeah that's if, true i'm a consultant right i go to a customer and i say okay i do a first run for the model and i see there are no issues i saved a lot of time I know yep. that I don't have to look at the dumb things that uh, there could be. I, I know, okay, did, if there is a performance issue, it's a serious one. I, I have to spend time here. I know that in advance. This has a value. It saves True. me time to spend, to review all the measures and to exclude the obvious things. Mm. So the decision has been that, no, the trial doesn't make sense. Yeah, because there, there's probably a lot of people out there who would ever only need to buy it once. And if they get the trial, that's just eliminated a large you market buy one run. It's thirty dollars. only just need one. Yeah. Your company with one for report. A few other, for a and, few weeks, yeah. it's still $30. Then it will be 45 but now it's still $31.50. Okay. I mean, it's cheap enough. That's totally fair then. Okay. Excellent. Um, yeah, we'll use that to wrap up then. Um, Marco, I think we had a peak of about 84 people uh, tuning into yeah, this. You nice. always manage to draw a really good crowd. So um, this has been fantastic. And I, I'm sure I'll have you back on in about, you know, a, uh, eight to 12 months when there's even more uh, features available in this yeah, and, uh, yeah. another good opportunity to showcase some of them. So Fantastic. thank you for taking time out of your Friday evening for this. And um, I will thank look forward you. to having thank you back on soon. Thank you very much. Have a good night. All right. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for watching. Please consider hitting that like and subscribe button. And if you want to help support this channel, take a look at our channel memberships or our merchandise store for cool swag. And last but not least, please consider sharing this video on your social media platform of choice to help our channel grow. So, until next time.